this uh, fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Today's theme is a house for my name in your heart. And the text for the sermon is based on 2 Chronicles. Our opening hymn is To Your Temple, Lord I Come. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. And let us pray. Almighty God, by the working of your Holy Spirit, grant that we may gladly hear your word proclaimed among us and follow its directing. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is Second Chronicles 6, 3-11. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. And I chose no man as prince over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, it is not you who shall build the house, but your son, who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have set the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the people of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 119, verses 153 to 160. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your just decrees. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust, because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your just and righteous decrees endures forever. The epistle is Romans 7, 1-13. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? Thus a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies... She is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin... Seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it, killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. 
Did that which is good, then, bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, TLO, and welcome from my home in Woodbury. I'm happy to be with you this morning. I would like to talk to the children this morning about this happy face. I have a couple things in my hand. I'm going to start with this happy face. Okay, so this happy face represents someone named Hananiah. And Hananiah loved to make people happy. That's why I have a happy face. The problem was Hananiah would do things to make people happy by lying to them. What? Oh, wait, hold on. There's something he wants to tell me. Hang on just a second. Let me, yeah, Hananiah, yeah, uh-huh. What? That's amazing. Good news from Hananiah. He said that I am going to be given a brand new, enormous home. What? Wait, hey, wait, there's more. Wait. Uh huh. Uh huh. What? Can it get any better? You guys, are you ready for this? My brand new, enormous, beautiful home is going to be made completely and totally out of candy. I know, Hannah and I said, it's gonna happen. Sure will be nice to have that great big, beautiful, tremendous home made completely out of candy. Isn't that the best news? Hannah and I, uh, you're the best. Thanks for telling me that. It makes me so happy. I'm so excited. All right, guys, do you think that I'm really going to get a great, big, beautiful home? Do you think that I'm going to be given a great, big, beautiful, enormous home made completely out of candy? He's lying. Hannah and Naya was lying to me. That's pretty bad. I get it that he wants people to be happy, but making people happy by lying to them? No, that's not the way to go. Now, here's the thing. Hananiah was a real person that lived long ago, long, long ago, long before Jesus was even on the earth. And Hananiah did tell lies. But worse than that, he told lies about God. Now, he did it because he wanted everybody to love him and think that he's so great and happy all the time. So he did it to make people happy, but it was bad what he was doing. He told them lies about God. In, in a story from the Old Testament, which is before Jesus was born, God's people had started um, really turning away from God. They weren't listening to his rules anymore. They weren't showing love and kindness anymore. They were doing some very, very bad things and God had warned them. He had said, you are my people and you need to follow my rules. I want you to show love and kindness, but they weren't. They were showing meanness and selfishness and it was really, really bad. Not just like a bad day, but bad, bad all the time. So God said, um, watch out. Because if you don't turn away from all those evil things, you're going to be punished. Well, here came an army to attack them. But Hananiah lied. And he said, oh, guys, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about this army that's coming. Don't worry about it. God will protect you and he will take care of you and you're gonna win. You don't have to worry lies. He was lying. 
God had warned them. He had said, turn away from evil or you'll be punished. And then when the punishment was coming, did they turn away from evil? No, they listened to the lies. People don't like to hear bad news. Now, here's the thing. God still loved them. He always loves us. And he wanted his people to turn away from evil. So he sent Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was more like this. Bad news. Well, kind of. He said to the people, Hananiah has been lying to you. You're going to be destroyed if you don't turn away from evil. It's going to happen. You need to stop doing bad things right now. You need to turn away from evil and you need to turn back to God and love his people and show kindness and compassion, not selfishness. They did not want to hear that. They wanted to keep doing the bad things. That's kind of how we are. When we're sinning, we don't want people to tell us to stop. We want to just keep sinning. Now, we don't have Jeremiah to come talk to us. But we do have friends, friends who can say, you're sinning, you need to stop. That's not what God wants you to do. We have parents to help us. We have pastors to help us. We have teachers to help us. We, have, we are surrounded by people who love God and will tell us the bad news. They will tell us, you need to stop, even if we don't wanna hear it. That's what God's people needed to hear. That's what we need to hear when we're sinning. And when you think about it, that is actually good news. It sounds like bad news, but it is good news. Because when we turn away from evil, that means we're turning back to God and his love. That means we're going to receive forgiveness, always, every time. He'll forgive us every single time when we repent. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to repent, turn back to him. He will forgive us, and he always loves us. That's the amazing, wonderful gift that he has given us. So sometimes uh, when you're doing something bad and somebody comes to tell you, it might not sound like good news, but it is because you'll be turning back to God. Let's say a prayer. Would you fold your hands, bow your head, and listen as I pray. Here we go. Dear Jesus, you love us and care for us. Help us to hear your words, even though we don't want to. Help us to turn from our sin and back to you. Amen. All right, enjoy the rest of the service and the rest of the day. And uh, kind of try to show how much God loves you to all the people around you today. Bye. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Sins and 
grace to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for sin? Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's meditation is based on 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And here we learn about how Solomon um, dedicated the temple. And so this is what we're going to be discussing today. The theme being a house for God's name. Is there anything more important or even meaningful about what goes on in this building? Think about that for a minute. Um, I stand here before you as uh, one recording a message for you, and yet it's tied into this building here, Trinity Lone Oak Lutheran Church and School, a beautiful facility, some of which was built in 1902, a congregation that goes back uh, many, many years. And yet, is there anything more important or meaningful anywhere in this world even that goes on outside of the Christian church, the context of a worship service uh, where God's people are gathered, where God's people are gathering. Is what goes on here boring? Some people might say that uh, church is boring and it's not worth really the time or the uh, taking away a Sunday to spend time in worship. It's hard to do so. It's hard to take away the kind of time that, that you'd rather maybe be doing something else. Is what goes on here irrelevant for our lives or is it relevant? How does what goes on here compare with what goes on anywhere else? Let's think about that for a little bit. How do we use this building? What is, what is it used for? When we come into this place, the sanctuary, we use it to worship our God. Here's where we hear God's word. Here's where baptisms occur. Uh, both children, infants, and adults. Here's where God's word is proclaimed in song. We hear it, Old Testament, Epistle, and Gospel readings, but we also sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in our hearts to God. Here's where there are weddings, where, where husbands and wives are brought together into a lifelong union between man and woman. Here is where funerals take place, where we remember those who, whom we love, who have died, and we gather around God's word and are comforted, and we hear stories and join together in fellowship with one another uh, in memory of the one who has died. Here's where we confess our sin and receive the absolution. Here's where we gather for communion to receive the forgiveness of sin through the, through the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Here is where young and old join together in prayer 
join together in faith, join together for those who are sick, pray for our nation, pray for those in trouble. Here's where the eyes of those who are blinded by sin are open because of the Holy Spirit's work in the Word. Here is where those whose hearts have been rejecting God are open by Him to hear, to learn, to grow in their faith and their trust in Him, to know what is true and right and pure, and to know the righteousness that comes only through the love and the mercy that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Should we perhaps as a church do more to fit in with what's going on in the culture around us? Should we try to do what the world wants us to do a little better? Or should we stand strong and firm on the foundation of Christ and His Word? This is the house of the Lord, the place where His glory dwells among the people of God. He dwells in you, in your heart, in your mind, and He dwells as we gather together, as two or three gather together in Word. Um, we hear and we gather in the Spirit, working in our hearts to learn and to grow in our faith. As we think about perhaps what should we, what should we be doing to reach the, the community, one of the things we want to, with the gospel, we don't want to change the message. We, we don't want to change what we do. All of those things that I mentioned are things that we do. Many of them right here in the sanctuary, the house of God that has been dedicated for this very purpose to worship Him, to praise Him, to receive His gifts and His blessings. Our text for today goes into what goes on in a worship service like this. What goes on in a place like this is truly a work of God. It's carried out by the God of Exodus. This scripture passage points us to Christ because when, when Solomon dedicated the temple of the Lord, that he had built, that his father was unable to build, but he was able to build, then Solomon was pointing to the fact that God himself one day would build a house, a house even more magnificent than the temple that was built by human hands through Solomon and his efforts and those, those who were dedicated to that task. But it is in this place um, where God is at work, the God who helped his people Israel, freed his people Israel from slavery, the God who established the, the tabernacle, a place of worship, and where his glory dwelt in the people of God who were formed into the nation of Israel in the wilderness. And then in the house of God that was dedicated here in Jerusalem, there in Jerusalem by Solomon. So this temple, that temple, and this one here too, points to the God who sent Christ, who is our Savior, to die and to rise again for us and for our salvation. So the temple points to the death and the resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God had promised to David um, that it wouldn't be him who would build a temple, because even though David had wanted to build him a temple, it was in his heart to build God a temple, but God had something else in mind. He wanted his own son to build that temple. The Bible teaches that there was too much blood on David's hands because as a king, he had, uh, he had gone to war and there was just too much blood on his hands to build a temple because God has not made man for violence. And violence, whether it be even military or as a necessary uh, violence or um, murder, which is absolutely uh, against God's will, that is an attack against God's image. And so David would not be permitted by God to build a temple simply because he was a man of war. But instead, he told David, God told David that your son would build a house and for a, a temple for the Lord. And so God chose Solomon to build that temple. 
It's amazing because even the name Solomon means peace. It comes from the word Hebrew word for peace. And so Solomon is the one who would be able to build that house for the name of the Lord. And so when Solomon was given responsibility over the nation after King David, he set out to build that house. And in the night, uh, God visited Solomon and said, Ask what I shall give you. Uh, Solomon asked God for wisdom and asked him to give him knowledge to govern God's people because they were so great. And so by requesting wisdom, Solomon was not seeking his own gain, but in his own heart, he desired not possessions, he desired not wealth or honor or the life of his enemies. Instead, God, uh, because he asked for wisdom, granted his prayer. And in the first five chapters of Second Chronicles, uh, it refers to Solomon making preparation for the building of the house for the Lord the furn and the furnishings of the temple. And so uh, Solomon was getting ready then to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And when he did so, in chapter 5, we see that the temple was filled with the glory of God. The same glory uh, that filled the tabernacle in the Old Testament time, uh, back when the people of God were in the wilderness in the times of Moses. There's truly uh, nothing that Solomon could do to bring God down into that temple. There's nothing that the Israelite people could do in the wilderness. In fact, they had rebelled against him, uh, and yet he was still with them. So there's nothing that people can do, nothing you and I nor I can do to bring God down into this space, into this place, into our hearts or minds um, by our efforts. All of the effort, all of the efforts that the skill that Solomon and Hiram had done to complete the building of the temple over the seven years that it took to build it was truly something that God himself had done. God alone had given the artisans and all those who were, who were making all the furnishings and even the building itself, um, God was the one who provided all those resources and all those skills. God's glory did not enter the temple of, um, because of the magnificence of the building itself, but rather because of the great promise that he had given to his people that he would be their God and that they would be his people and that he would dwell with them. God dwelt with his people and he fulfills that promise ultimately fully um, through Christ himself, who is the one that was promised to David that would, would establish an eternal reign of the kingdom uh, for David's house. The temple that Solomon built was a beautiful, magnificent temple, but it did not last. The fulfillment of an eternal house for God would not be fully uh, fulfilled until the coming of Christ, and that when Christ sacrificed was sacrificed for us on the cross. And it is through that sacrifice, through that final nailing of his hands and feet into that tree, and then him saying, it is finished, then the sins of the world have been paid for, and God once again has opened up a dwelling place for us in His holy presence, and also has now come down to us to bring us forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation. It is through Christ then that He comes and that His dwelling, His dwelling place is in you, and you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God chooses to bring himself to us through his word and sacrament. And he does it through these means of grace. We call them the means of grace. God had chosen to come to the Israelite people, to the temple, through the temple, through the, the work of the priests in the temple as the sacrifices were made and as the prayers were brought before the people. And then on the day of atonement, the blood was splattered on the people for the forgiveness of sin. So God chose to make this place, the place where the Ark of the Covenant would be placed. And then through that 
Day of Atonement, the sins of the people would, would be forgiven. Ultimately, that was done through Christ, but the temple of the Old Testament pointed to the coming salvation that would be in Christ, and it actually gave them that same salvation that you and I have received through Christ. Well, God has chosen in our day to use a word and sacrament to bring us salvation. Here is where we find comfort. When we hear the word of God proclaimed that God loved the world, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is our comfort. The temple of God is not something made by human hands. This is a beautiful sanctuary. It's a, a place where, where we hear God's word and receive so many blessings. But ultimately, the temple that God is making in you is a temple made by the Holy Spirit. And this is a temple that can never be destroyed by any of God's enemies. The word of the Lord is alive and at work in you to bring you to salvation. And also, the temple is going to be lasting forever now because of what Christ did, that the temple of God's church, all believers in Christ, will live forever because of what Christ has done. God has made for himself a house, a house for his name. And it is through the name of Jesus that he has established this eternal house. And it is through the names of, name of Jesus that God is bringing to you and to me forgiveness and salvation, even already right now. This God is present in bringing the forgiveness of sins through our baptism. When you were washed, when you were cleansed, you were brought into the family of God by God placing his name on you. And so the glory of the Lord at that time, back in the, in the days of Solomon, filled the temple. There was a tremendous uh, cloud that filled the temple. God had chosen that this would be his people. Israel would be his chosen nation. And Jerusalem would be the place where his glory dwelt, the city, his fortified city. And he would work through David to establish his reign, and then also through Solomon to build his temple. And so God set his heart on choosing this nation, Israel, through whom the Savior would come. And he has also set his heart on you. God has a deep love for you. Like he loved David and chose Solomon, so also he loves you and he called you to be his child, and he has given you a new name. And that is to the name of child. You are one of his children. When we begin our worship services, we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is the name into which you were baptized. That is the name which God has given to you. He's placed his own name on you. And it is through the cross of Christ now that he has brought you into that relationship uh, with you. When Solomon dedicated the temple and the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, that Ark contained the Word of God. It contained the Torah, the first five books of Moses. We too have the Word of God. The Spirit has written more books, more, he has inspired more writers, especially the New Testament writers as well. When you think of the Gospel writings, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the epistles and the general epistles and the book of Revelation. This, the, the entire Old Testament and New Testament scriptures were written for our learning so that we could know our, know our faith, believe and trust in the Lord, and know that his word is true. We have the written word of God, and that is what we hear, that is what we believe, and that is what we confess with our mouths, we speak it out, and share it with our friends and our neighbors. It is in his name then too that God has promised to hear us. We come into his presence to hear his word, hear of his love for us in Christ, hear all of the things that he has done for us by the power of his name, and then we respond in worship to him, in prayer and in praise. 
God has made a covenant with you and with me, and that covenant is an eternal covenant. It is fulfilled by the one who gave his life for the ransom, for ransom for many. It is the one who gave his life for the, for the sins of the world. He established the new covenant by his blood, our Lord Jesus did. And it is, an, it is a covenant that has eternal blessings and promises. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. The place of God's dwelling uh, in our hearts is, is going to be revealed. What's in our hearts is going to be revealed on the last day. Solomon blessed the worshipers that came into the temple by proclaiming the mighty deeds that God had done, the mighty deeds that he did when he released people from captivity to slavery, when he took them through the wilderness. God had done so many great and wonderful things. And Solomon re recounted how God had been with the Israelite people and, and uh, the fulfillment of that promise was now coming true that he would establish a house for his name. As our congregation gathers together, whether online for worship or in person, which uh, we're doing now, of course, we are so grateful for the word that God has given to us, and we constantly pray that God would use the word to build our faith in Him, our trust in Him, that we would know that our sins are forgiven, that um, we confess His name as our God, and that as He has promised, He would keep His promise, and that we would one day live eternally with Him in heaven. So right now, as we are in worship, we turn to the things of God, and we respond to Him in faith and in trust, bringing our prayers before Him. Because we know that He has chosen uh, us for His kingdom, but He has also showed us the way to salvation, which is our Lord Jesus. David didn't get to build the temple, but his son was able to build the temple. Our lives don't always turn out the way that we expect. I'm sure David uh, was thinking that he would be able to build that temple, but uh, he was unable to. God knows the needs that we have. He knows the secrets of our hearts. And he knew that David's heart desired to build this temple, but he would not have him build the temple. It was for, son, for his son Solomon to do so. He also knew that God had trusted in him for his, that he also knew David's heart in that David had trusted in God for salvation, for forgiveness, and that through the cleansing uh, with hyssop, all of David's sins were forgiven. When we come into the presence of God here, we don't always uh, receive the kinds of things that we want. We might pray for things and and the Lord has reasons why maybe those prayers are, are not being answered the way that maybe we would like or wonder or expect or when we think they should be answered. But we do know this, the Lord hears our prayers. We also know this, that when we come into the presence of the Lord, all His promises in Christ are yes. And so we can listen to these promises and boldly hold on to them in faith. And we can go out and share these blessings with our neighbors. We don't hold our faith to ourselves. We share the blessings that God has given to us with those around us. So truly, what goes on in this place, in this sanctuary, is exciting. It's life-changing. I don't know how many times people have told me, my faith is growing. My faith is growing and God is working mighty wonders as I read God's word, as I, as I worship, as I hear God's word, as I receive the sacrament. Remember my baptism. God is building my faith. And that's what God's work is. He is using the Spirit. He has sent His Spirit to use the Word of God to build you up in faith so that you can one day hold on to Him um, even as you enter into your eternal home. As God entered into this, uh, entered into the temple with His glory, filling the temple with His glory as a cloud, Christ has promised that he would return. He told his disciples that he would return and that he would be with us always, but he will return. And the angel even said that when Christ returns, he will return as he left. He will return uh, on the clouds 
He will return in all the glory and splendor of the house that He has built for you and for me. The house that He has built by His name for His glory. And one day He will take us to be with Him in that eternal house in heaven. During the time that we're here on earth, though, He has not left us alone. He has provided us His word. He has given us the sacraments to assure us of forgiveness and then also to empower and equip and strengthen us in our faith to go out and boldly confess His name before all people so that all might come to the knowledge of the truth and be gathered together into that one house, His own church, and be with Him in the dwelling place of God in heaven. May God grant us the courage, the faith, the strength, and the words to say by the power of the Spirit to bring others to the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, who dwells in you, and he will be with you even to the end of the age. In the name of Jesus, amen. And the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, amen. We join now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. so rule and govern your church and all her pastors and ministers that she may be preserved in the pure doctrine of your saving word, defended against all adversity and protected from all adversaries, that thereby faith may be strengthened and love increased in us. Grant health, wisdom, and integrity to all in authority over us, especially to the President of the United States the governor of this state, the Congress, all legislative bodies, and all judges and magistrates. Endow them with your spirit and with respect for your word, that they would serve your good pleasure for the maintenance of righteousness and the punishment of wickedness, so that we all may live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. According to your gracious will, Turn the hearts of our enemies and make them to walk with us in humility and peace. 
Grant to those in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, the healthful spirit of your grace for healing, strength, comfort, and relief. Bless especially those who suffer for the sake of your name and your word. Hear us on behalf of all those whom we name in our hearts. Give them courage to stand firm in their afflictions and patience until the day of your deliverance. Preserve us from pestilence and every evil. Give us favorable weather and cause the fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season and offer your praise and thanksgiving for all your goodness to us. Lend your blessing to all honorable vocations and honest industry, that we may serve where our skills and abilities may be of good use. Bless the arts and music, that we may please you and be encouraged by all that is good, right, true, and beautiful. Give to all husbands and wives grace to live together in love and faithfulness. Bless the homes and families of your people, that they may be places where your name is honored and love is nurtured. Give your special grace to the widow, the orphan, all mothers with child, the aged and the infirm, that we may grant them comfort, aid, and protection. All these things for which you would have us ask of you, we pray you to grant us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we are bold to call you Father, and in whose name we pray, trusting in your mercy and confident that you will give answer to our prayers. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. and